Okay, members, it's now time for questions to the Minister of Health, and we will start with list of questions, and I call Martine Anderson. The member for a question. On Saturday, the 14th of March, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, my Permanent Secretary, the Chief Medical Officer, and I met with the Taoiseach, Leo Varadka, the Minister for Health, Simon Harris, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Simon Coveney, and the Chief Medical Officer, Dr Tony Holohan. The purpose of our meeting was to ensure that actions and messages in our two jurisdictions are as coordinated as effectively as is possible as we move into the next phase of the response to the pandemic of coronavirus, COVID-19. My department and the Public Health Agency have been working with their counterparts in the Republic as well as the rest of the UK since the emergence of COVID-19. The two Chief Medical Officers and the Deputy Chief Medical Officers are in frequent contact and the Health and Social Care Board and the Health Service Executive are looking at areas of further cooperation. Martina Anderson, supplementary. Uh, Minister, I'm sure you're aware there's lots of concerns across the north. There's concerns in my constituency, and I would say every constituency, with regards to the British government's decision to only test the most seriously ill. Uh, my phone has been inundated, as I'm sure other MLAs have been the same this weekend. So could you clearly um, outline the criteria by which testing the coronavirus is being provided for to the people in, in the north of Ireland? I thank the member for her questions. Um, look, in regard to, to testing, and I thank AQW, uh, the next question actually talks about numbers, so I'll keep that to that. We're currently working to the, the national advice uh, position, but due to constraints on lab capacity, locally and nationally, testing is now being prioritised for a number of groups, and the current order for priority of testing during periods of significant demand is, first of all, a patient requiring critical care for the management of pneumonia, acute respir respiratory distress syndrome, or influenza, an influenza-like illness, or an alternative indication of severe illness has been provided, for example, severe, severe pneumonia or ARDS. The next group is for all other patients who require admission to hospital for management of pneumonia, ARDS, or ILL. A further group, then, is the cluster of disease in residential or care settings, for example, long-term care facilities um, and prisons. And then for the symptomatic healthcare workers will be tested as well. So this is under active review nationally and locally, and additional capability is being urgently worked up in the lab system, and this will ease some of the demand pressures on lab services. So it's not that we've reduced the testing, it's we're now prioritising the testing that we the capability that we have available, but we are increasing that capability. And I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer. Could I ask the Minister what uh, work is underway to ensure health and social care trusts continue to deliver the provision of therapies for children with additional needs during school closures? Well, look, one of the things I'd be clear of, the health service will not stop because of coronavirus COVID-19. Our core work continues, but as I said and I put out in a statement on Friday, we will be looking at the reduction in the scale back of a number of procedures and elective care surgeries that go on. And the further and longer this goes on, I need to be honest, I need to be frank to every member in this House, that core service will reduce as we make how we tackle COVID-19 our key priority, because this virus will be with us for a period of time. So what we're doing now in the reduction of elective care surgeries and the other procedures that we are stepping back at this minute in time is to allow us to reprofile our hospitals, reprofile wards, and actually train up our health and service, uh, our health service workers, so that when we do come into a stage where those dedicated facilities and those highly trained staff are actually need, we're placed to do that. Uh, in regards to the surge plans that I suppose that come under the, the designation of uh, what that piece of work has been taken forward, I intend to make them public before the end of this week, so that everybody understands when their local hospital or their, or their constituent or a, a family relative rings them and says, my, my procedure has been cancelled, that they can realise that this is to allow us to profile the health service so that we're able to meet the demand when it comes. And I call Jim Allister. Uh, the Minister referred to the North-South Ministerial Council get-together on Saturday. Uh, before that, the Northern Ireland Executive had settled its view on medical advice for example, about uh, school closures. How helpful is it 
at events such as that, if the Deputy First Minister then repudiates the policy set by the Executive when Northern Ireland is seeking, in the interest of all its people, to have rational discussions with its neighbour? I understand the, the, the member's point, but what I will say to everyone in this House, and what I will say to anybody listening to this or anybody watching this, folks, this is no time for politics, either north, south or east, west. Yeah. This is a time where I think everybody looking outside this House and looking to us as individuals is actually looking to us for leadership and collective leadership. The executive met this morning and discussed in great detail where we are and where we're going as an executive and how we tackle COVID-19. And look, everybody out there listening to this knows there are differences. But one thing that I want to assure anybody listening to this or anybody watching this, that I as Health Minister have one focus, and one focus only, and that is to make sure our National Health Service is fit to tackle COVID-19 and coronavirus when it comes and when it gets to a stage that people out there will truly realise what a pandemic is actually coming down the road at us. I call Claire Bailey. And I'm mindful of the recent strike action taken by nurses to stress to us that they were working in unsafe conditions. Um, is the minister content with Boris Johnson's government plan for the herd immunity um, that we and our health service are able and capable to deal with the fallout if that goes ahead? I'll be clear to the member. The herd immunity language or the herd immunity principle or precept is not one that is supported or endorsed by my department nor me as health minister. We will work through the phases that have been clearly laid out in the COVID-19 action plan at the start. We worked strenuously to make sure that we were fit for purpose during containment. We have now moved, moved into delay. I can assure the member. Herd immunity is not a tool that I will be utilising in Northern Ireland as a way to contact this virus. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Minister. And uh, I realise the pressure that you uh, and your department are under, uh, and I commend you for, for, for the work and the seriousness of the situation. Um, does the Minister accept the fact that, as an island, the level of risk um, we, we share that risk in an all-island um, uh, piece. Therefore, the assessment of the risk and announcement of shifts and stages of that risk should be done in unison. This is not a, a north-south or an east-west. We need to work collectively together uh, in order to minimise the risks of all our citizens. And, and I can assure the member that there, there is no reticence on my part into what we need to do to tackle COVID-19 coronavirus here in Northern Ireland. She mentions the pressures on me. Look, the pressures on me are nothing compared to the pressures that are currently being put on our frontline health services, on our frontline health workers, should that be our nurses, our doctors, our GPs, our pharmacists. And what I would want to take this opportunity to say to people, you know, as you approach your doctor, your pharmacist, your dentist, that frontline health worker, no matter where they be in our system, folks, give them patience, give them space and allow them to adapt to this ever-changing situation that we're now in, because the pressures that I'm under do not reflect anything that the pressures they're under as professionals who want to do their best for our population and for the people that they're presenting to them. So I just ask people, you know, please be patient and please give those health professionals the respect that they deserve and give them a bit of space to allow them to make the adaptations and changes that we need to do while we reprofile our health service to tackle this, this COVID-19 coronavirus. Before I call the next member, uh, orals question 7 and 12 have been withdrawn and I call Doug Beattie. Question 2, please. Um, I thank the member for, for his question. And Mr Speaker, normally questions of a like-minded subject will be grouped, but I didn't do that in one and two because I wanted to give as many members an opportunity as possible for supplementaries. So in this, as of 2 p.m. today, 1,171 individuals have been tested for COVID-19 in Northern Ireland, and there have been 52 confirmed positive cases. That's an increase of seven new positive cases from yesterday. 
To inform members prior to the 13th of March, the total published tests included only individuals that met the case definition. That was those who were connected to travel and met the clinical criteria. However, I would like to assure the House that during this time, wider testing was also being conducted across all trusts in Northern Ireland. So for absolutely clarity, those individuals are now included in the overall testing. So that would explain why we've seen an approximate jump of 400 tests overnight. We've now expanded the definition as to those tests that we actually declare, rather than just those tests that met the case definition. Uh, I thank the Minister um, for his answer, and I, I just want to go on record uh, in thanking the Minister and his staff, um, scientists uh, and healthcare professionals for all they are doing in combating COVID-19 on our, on our behalf. Uh, and I will condemn all day long anybody who refers to them as a shower of bastards. Um, can I therefore ask the Minister to give his assessment of the resilience of the local health service in facing what many agree will be the biggest health emergency in generations? I thank the, thank the member. You know, while this situation is serious, I can advise members that the detailed plans are in place in the event of an outbreak spreading across the UK and the Republic of Ireland with sustained community transmission. Our health service is used to managing infections and we are prepared. Health systems across the globe are coming under extreme and increasing pressures as this virus spreads. Ours will be no different, and it is bound to take its toll. As I have said, normal business on our health and social care may not be possible. Some activities will be scaled back. We have been planning for the first positive case in Northern Ireland, and we had that robust infection control in place. My department has established a new directive for surge planning, as I mentioned earlier. The directive will work with surge planners in the health and social care system to ensure preparedness across the sector in response to COVID-19. We all, however, have a part to play in helping the health service cope with this disease by ensuring that we follow the public health advice and by practising good personal hygiene, which is very effective in preventing the spread of this virus. I call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers um, so far. I would also like to commend him uh, and, indeed, the Department of, of Health for the uh, serious pressure they are under at this time and we uh, fully appreciate the time that you are giving to addressing these questions. And of course, it can't go past um, uh, all the health workers um, and all those professionals involved in helping us deal with this um, very serious crisis. Um, Minister, I would just like to ask if you could give this House details of where um, our health professionals can get the most up-to-date information and guidance on, on how they should be behaving in regards to COVID-19. Um, on a daily basis. I thank the member for for what will be, I think, a very important piece of information. While we've been working through this, our, our public health agency in regards and working alongside the Health and Social Care Board as well, have been provided update pieces of guidance on guidance and information, frequently asked questions. Um, procedures to a number of health prof professionals and sectors. Those are available on the Public Health Agency's website and also on the Health and Social Care Board's website. What we will say and what I do say to the health professionals and anybody out there, the reason we are not sending out those out in a hard copy or posting them out or giving them as, as, as something somebody can hold in their hand is this situation changes so frequently and so often that what I ask those working in the healthcare system look to those that up to date online advice because this situation changes hour by hour, if not day by day. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Speaker and Minister, thank you for, for your work over the last week and beyond. Um, I just wanted to, to raise uh, to come back to the issue you talked about there about symptomatic health care workers. I was contacted by a constituent who is now self-isolating and he's very concerned about the number of um, health care workers that he came into contact before his symptoms um, manifested themselves. Um, as you know, um, frontline health care workers will be given the flu vaccine to protect themselves, their colleagues and their patients. And in the absence of a vaccine, do you not think that it would be beneficial that our frontline staff are actually tested as a matter of course at this stage in the pandemic? Thank you. As, as I said to the member earlier, earlier or said it in an answer earlier, um, 
Currently, we don't have the capacity to provide that screening testing. I think is what she refers to. If we were to test every member of our, our health and social care system for that, but if any member of, of our health and social care board, as I said, is one of the cohorts that we look at, if they think they are presenting with symptoms of COVID-19 coronavirus, we will make sure they get a test as appropriate. Because the last thing that I can afford is our health care system and the workers in it to actually fall and foul to COVID-19. So it's important if the member has a specific name or an example, if she wants to give me it offline, I'll follow up and see where, what trust they're in and what provision can be made to get them tested. I call Emma Sheeran. Carly, and thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Do we have an accurate number of the number of people who are currently self-isolating but are yet to be tested? Um, we don't, because in the, change, in the change of definition that we actually gave, what we encourage people to do was if they were presenting or feeling they had COVID-19-like symptoms, was to isolate themselves for seven days. So we've no, I suppose, we've no central database as to who is actually self-isolating at this minute in time. But what I would say to those who are doing it, thank you. Because by taking that responsible first step, they are making sure that the member of their family, a member of their community, or a loved one actually isn't being put at risk by them giving them uh, COVID-19, if they have it. There's a number of people who are self-isolating at this minute in time who have symptoms that may turn out to be flu or cold, but we can't take that risk. But what we're asking them to do, if anybody's presenting with symptoms of coronavirus, COVID-19, the self-isolation for seven days is what's been advised at this minute in time. If their conditions worsen, certainly contact your GP and present, but at this minute in time, we don't keep that central register. But I'm through, through the grateful for those people who are taking the self-decision to start sell, uh, the social isolation measures that we will have to adopt very, very soon. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Minister as well and commend him on his leadership uh, thus far and what is a very serious and worrying issue for many, and also to commend our frontline staff for the great work they're doing and their families for supporting them, uh, going out there very bravely to support each of us in the role that they do in saving lives. Uh, Minister, my question is focused in, on, in relation to life-saving equipment such as ventilators uh, and also hospital beds. And could you provide an insight to the House as to the numbers of each uh, uh, in each of the trust areas, please? The member will forgive me if I don't have the numbers by, by trust area. I'm surprised he hasn't put that down as a written question because he's, he's asked quite another number along those lines. Uh, our current capacity in um, Just a minute, I had. Yep, sorry. In regards to ventilators, there has been a significant increase on the issue of mechanical ventilators following meter reports um, in recent weeks. There are currently 88 adult ICU beds in Northern Ireland. The Critical Care Network have plans to expand this to 126 adult beds if necessary. There are currently 139 mechanical ventilators available across Northern Ireland Health and Social Care Trusts, and to cope with this possible increase in beds, an extra 40 have been ordered. Um, 30 adult units and 10 paediatric units, which will bring the total to 179 by the end of this month. Um, so that's where we are in regar regards to ventilators. But in regards to beds, um, we are, as I said, profiling across the National Health Service as to how we cohort in wards, how we cohort in different hospitals. When it comes to ventilation, um, we will come to a point, because we've turned down elective surgeries, that we won't be using operating theatres. So we'll be able to use the ventilation points and the ventilators that are available to that to actually ventilate pa patients. What I will say to you that this house is that's the detail of plan that we are making. That we, when we get to that stage, we're planning for it now because we're under no illusion what's coming down the road at us. Moving on, I call Gemma Dolan. Question number three. Uh, again, I thank the, the member for a question. The initial areas of implementation of the primary care multidisciplinary team model were selected through a competitive process. All health and social care trusts were invited to apply in partnership with their local GP federations, with seven applications subsequently being received from across Northern Ireland. These were assessed against a range of criteria, including the commitment to multidisciplinary working and draft principles underpinning the MDT model reorganisation of services to support this new model and improve patient access, support from all GP Federation members addressing health and inequality, co-production and design with patients and service users, and synergy and coordination with existing reform initiatives. 
Following this assessment, the Down and London area areas, in partnership with the South East and Western Trust respectively, were selected to be the first areas to implement the model with the allocation of further funds in year. It was decided that the third placed applications, West Belfast Federation and Belfast Trust, should commence the implementation of the first contact physiotherapy element of the model, proceeding to a full model as funds become available. A further all allocation from, from transformation funding during 2019 20 was sufficient to support the introduction of the model in two new areas in order to ensure that patients across Northern Ireland could have access to the benefits of a primary care MDT. The Northern and Social Southern Trusts were invited to each submit an application in partnership with one of the GP federations in their area. As a result, implementation of the model is now underway in the Causeway and Nurian district areas. It is anticipated by the end of March 2020 around 462,000 patients will have access to the services of an MDT in their local GP practice. I call Gemma Dolan, supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, but would the Minister agree that future rollout of MDTs across the North should prioritise areas with GP shortages and recruitment and retention issues like my own constituency of Fermanagh and South Tyrone? Um, I am aware of the pressures facing general practice in the South West, and I would reassure the member that I am committed to implementing the model in all areas of Northern Ireland. However, transformation of this scale cannot happen overnight and must be balanced with the ongoing provision of all their services across the health and social care system. In the London area, the Western Trust are still experiencing ongoing challenges in recruitment to MDTs while progress is being made towards the full rollout of the model. Recruitment is still ongoing for physios, social workers, additional health visitors and district nurses. Once appropriate funding is in place, further areas for implementation of the multidisciplinary team model will be selected on the basis of readiness and the ability to deliver on the need of the location population. But in the meantime, my department continues to make significant financial investment in general practice, with the focus of supporting both GPs and the wider primary care team and contributing to reducing the workload experienced by our GPs. The number of GP training places has increased significantly um, from 65 in 2015 to 111 in 2019. So that, along with where we can go next with the funding for MDTs, will make, be crucial in how we develop this model, always taking into consideration where the pressures are in regards to coronavirus and COVID-19 on the, on the system in general. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the uh, Minister uh, to give his assessment of the success of the uh, pilot schemes uh, of the uh, multidisciplinary model? Um, I, I thank the member for his question because I said earlier I think it's important that we do acknowledge that the work of the National Health Service um, goes on, although we will have to reduce it. Um, in regard to, to the success of the MDTs, we are getting that feedback that they are working. Where GPs in the past thought they would never uh, see the need of having a pharmacy in-house, a physiotherapist in-house, or, or psychology in the house, they are now realising the value that that multidisciplinary team who are able to see a patient when they come through the door as early as possible and they can be directed to the professional help and support and guidance that they need. But I think there's also a change in mindset as to the user uh, and the patient as they present that they don't always need to see a GP as the first point of call. They call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. And I thank the Minister for his answers and for all his efforts. I think we genuinely uh, put on record our thanks to all your work and your commitment. You've done a good job on behalf of the MLAs, on behalf of the Executive, on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland. But in relation to the multidisciplinary teams, uh, will cancer care patients get the investigations and the treatment that they require uh, during the ongoing corona crisis? And as I said um, in an earlier answer in a question specific on coronavirus, the core work of the National Health Service will continue. So those red flags, those treatments, those trauma patients that present will continue to receive that support because that's, that will be the core work of, that is the core work of the National Health Service. But what I will say to the member is that while we work through multidisciplinary teams and the transformation process and everything else that has been going on in the National Health Service, um, Coronavirus COVID-19 is now our day job, and that's where our focus is. The rest of it won't be parked, won't go to the wayside. The core principles and the supports that we need, 
but our, our focus is, is being reprofiled at how we get through the next period of time. I call the Lord's Kelly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, you, you have said about the difficulty in recruiting for multidisciplinary teams, and that uh, will be even more difficult setting uh, aside the coronavirus and the emergency that there is across our hospitals. I, I just wondered, have you given any consideration or had any discussion with Westminster about some exemptions in terms of pensions for recently retired healthcare professionals as to whether or not they will be brought back in, or indeed those that are in their final years and almost qualified. Are, are there any discussions ongoing on how to complement the, the uh, workforce? The member makes a valid point. On, on the first issue in regards to pensions, I think that was addressed um, in the budget. Uh, the, the Chancellor actually addressed that point and I'm thankful for that. So It does not come in this year, but I, it will not be retrospective right, right from my understanding, but it will have an impact um, next year. In regards to bringing forward uh, registration or those just about to pass their exams, that is something that's been looked at. It's been looked at along with the Royal Colleges, should it be of nursing and midwifery, all the other all all primary care professions and also in our domiciliary care staff as well, so that we can make sure that we have a cohort of, of professionals on support there as well. In regards to bringing back those who have just retired or recently retired, that is something we're looking at. And we also have to make sure that any change in legislation is make sure that the registration is also recognised and current as well. So look, we at some point very shortly will be reaching out and asking for anyone who can help, please help. Should that be in the voluntary and community sector? Should it be in the sports sector? Should it be in our faith-based organisations? Because as we move further into the social distancing or shielding uh, of our older population, we will become reliant um, on general and civic society to support those individuals while we go through this phase, which will be very challenging for many. Call Carl Nickellen. I thank the member um, for her question. Mr Speaker, if I could indulge maybe an extra period of time to answer what is also an important question. Um, as demonstrated by the Royal, Royal College of Paediatrics and Child's Health State of the Mind Report 2020, out of the four UK nations, Northern Ireland has the highest infant mortality rate at 4.2 per 1,000 live births. While that rate has reduced from 4.8 per 1,000 live births, this remains a key challenge that we must address. Like many health outcomes, there is also a difference in the infant mortality rate between our least and most deprived communities. The most recent figures are for the period 2013-17, when the most deprived areas had an infant mortality rate 18 per cent higher than the least deprived areas. I understand that the main causes of infant mortality include premature birth, birth asphyxia, pneumonia, congenital conditions and term birth compli complications. In addition, smoking in pregnancy has also been shown to contribute to increased infant mortality in 2017. The proportion of births where the mother reported smoking during pregnancy in the most deprived areas was almost five times the rate in the least deprived. There are a number of actions underway or being developed which will seek to have a positive impact on infant mortality. These include actions relating to the tobacco control strategy, such as carbon monoxide testing in antenatal care. Um, the Getting Ready for Baby project, which provides a group-based antenatal care and education through parenting classes for first-time parents and providing training to midwives. The Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle, which has been implemented in Northern Ireland to reduce perinatal mortality. The Social Wellbeing Antenatal Clinic, which has been established in the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust for Women with Additional Care Needs. The Family Nurse Partnership Programme, which is a preventative early intervention programme for teenage mothers. The Child Health Promotion Programme, Healthy Child, Healthy Future, and the implementation of the Maternity Strategy and work to address the recommendations of the RQIA reviews of that strategy. But we also need to be conscious that health outcomes are not just implicated by the clinical services we deliver. This evidence demonstrates that inequalities in health arise because of inequalities in the conditions in which people are born, grow up, live, work and age in. In order to address health inequalities, we therefore need to tackle the wider social detriments of health and address inequalities in these detriments. This approach is at the heart of making life better which is the, light, the executive's overarching strategic framework to improve health and address health inequalities. 
making life better is currently the subject of a comprehensive mid-term review. And that ends this period for a list of questions. Uh, we now move to topical questions. And before I call Trevor Clark, it's just to say that questions 3, 8, 9 and 10 have been withdrawn. Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And Mike Elders, can I thank the Minister for what work he has done and his executive colleagues have done thus far, and uh, indeed those in terms of the front line within the health service who are facing this uh, on a daily, as, as the Minister has already acknowledged. But, Minister, given that many people are, well, given numbers of people will probably or presumably be self isolating and the temptation to contact their GPs, are you content that the GP practices themselves have got sufficient uh, personal protection equipment to deal with these cases if they were to turn up at the surgeries? Call the Minister for Health. Uh, and I thank the member. And, I, and again, it gives me the opportunity to, to reinforce the message that we have been given. If anyone has or thinks they have symptoms of COVID-19, do not present to your GP. Do not go to the emergency department. Phone your GP, seek advice by telephone, and then that, that advice and guidance will be given. In, in regards to, to the PPE, um, as far as I'm aware, and, uh, GP and Central Pharmacy PPE packs were issued last week. These packs included essential PPE items for GPs and pharmacists should a, a patient present with symptoms. Uh, my department is in daily contact with the business service or organisation procurement and logistics services and a demand uh, management strategy is, is in place whereby they are working closely with trusts and emergency planner leads over allocation of PPE stocks within those trusts. The department has released quantities of PPE items from the pandemic influenza preparedness programme stockpile to support the BESO business as usual stockpile. So we do continue to, to issue and monitor and we have, we have a stockpile of PPE uh, centrally held. But what I would say, the, I think there was a call made yesterday from the Westminster Minister of Health in regards to if anyone who could make ventilators you know, to step up your production line. What I would like, likewise say, if there's anybody in Northern Ireland can do that or if they can provide PPE as well, start to look and to see if they can reprofile, retool, because there will be a need for this equipment. Trevor Clark, supplementary. I thank uh, the Minister for his answer. Um, in relation to that preparedness, has there been any conversations with any companies in Northern Ireland about scaling up at this stage? Well, that, in, in regards to the ventilators, there was a general call made yesterday from the Minister of Health, if anybody can do that. I think like, so JCB and Rolls-Royce were some of the companies that were actually responding to say they could reprofile and look to actually produce ventilators. If there is any companies in Northern Ireland, I think it's the Biz is, is leading on that central procurement. And if you want to scale up as well, in regard, they could do the same with PPE. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Minister, a number of, of GP surgeries are operating a telephone triage system now, which I have to say in my local area is working very well. But can you confirm what is happening regarding routine baby vaccinations and what's happening with health visitor community contact, please? In regards to baby vaccines, should proceed as normal for one of the things that we do have to make sure is that the vaccination programme for all those underlying health co conditions that we have vaccines available for, we utilise them to make sure we have a resilient population um, for those other conditions. In regards to the GP telephone triaging, that is something a number of GPs will be moving to. It's something that I think at this minute in time will be a change that patients may not be comfortable with, but in the conditions that we're in, I think it will become more the norm um, than the routine. So I would encourage those who need to go to the GP if they are, if they are presented with that that facility to make use of it and don't get angry with it. It's not the GP's fault. They're trying to manage the system that we are. In regards to visiting health and social care workers, that will continue as normal because we have to make sure that's there. But I'll check and get back to the members. There may be a scaling back in certain areas or certain, certain frequencies, but it's something we can't guarantee. But there is a value in what's been done. Kelly Armstrong, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much to the Minister. Um, and again, I'd like to reiterate what you've said about the frontline service staff when they're getting those phone calls, because I'm sure they're, they're getting it hard and heavy. But I would like to ask the Minister, um, when a child has, uh, you know, an organisation has been told that a child that is in their care, whether that's a child minder or child care facility or organisation, and when that child has been identified as having um, 
C19. What advice would you give to the organisation itself about what they should do to follow up once the child is out and getting their help, but what happens with the organisation that has those vulnerable children that they usually look after? Well, look, in regards to the procedure that they would follow would be the same as any other workplace, any other family. You know, if someone does present, make sure that all the precautions are taken that need to be taken to make sure there hasn't been contact tracing, how that, or there hasn't been contact with other people who carry an underlying symptom as well, and follow that. Follow the PHA guidance through in a specific location. That has been changed. That will update depending on the facility. If it's a childcare facility, that information should be online. In regards to come back to the GPs and that front three eye uh, service and telephone service, that we're now moving to a situation pharmacies will be doing the same because we can't expect them to take the brunt of the frontline service. So I ask people to, to take um, their time, take the consideration and appreciate the work that these people are doing under a very pressurised system. Call David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, previous uh, mandates administrations and ministers within this place uh, had outlined plans previously for a level two health centre in both Carrick and Larne in East Antrim. Uh, talking to colleagues, that appears now not to be the case going forward. Uh, would you have any comment or look at that? I, I haven't the detail of the, of the specific location that the member refers to today, but if he writes to me, I'll get back to him with the specifics in regards to that. If it has been raised elsewhere, you know, we'll get that answer back to the member as well. But what I would say in a more general point in regards to, to the questions that are coming forward, I'll ask members' indulgence as well as to the number of written questions and what comes forward to, to our department at this moment in time while we reprofile and try to cope with the pressures that are coming from coronavirus and COVID-19. So when issues like capital bills and all the rest of it, if there's an answer that's been provided before, we'll refer the member to that. David Hilly, supplementary. Mr Speaker, I don't require supplementary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I ask the Minister for his assessment of communication and information circulation around COVID-19, please? Okay. I suppose it is a very generic, generic question coming from, from the member, but what, what I will say is if people want communication and information in regards to COVID-19 and how it's affecting the general population and guidance and things to take, look to the professional bodies. Look to the reputable bodies. Don't rely on what you see, what you see on Twitter. Don't rely on what you see on Facebook. Don't you rely on what you see on every self-proclaimed expert that has come up on this disease in the past few months, that this disease has only presented itself. Look to those bodies that you can rely on. Look to the Health and Social Care Board for advice and guidance. Look to the Public Health Agency for advice and guidance, because that reliable, sustained, professional advice and guidance is there for those who want to look for it. For those who want to look for sensationalism, there are other methods and other, other avenues to get that. But I would say to people, make sure your advice is current and is professional. To on funding supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The difficulty is that the national government appears to be playing it down and firing out test balloons as to what they might do, um, which is unhelpful. The media, an element of the media, seems to be going for hype and sensationalism, uh, as the minister refers to. So it's very difficult for the public to know, Mr. Speaker, um, what the factual position is and exactly how to prepare. Um, so I would ask through you, the Minister, what can he do to improve clarity for the public in this situation where they're trying to find what is the actual factual position and not uh, degenerate into hysteria? The Member's point is, is very well made because the information that is out there um, needs to be heard clearly and professionally, and it needs to be heard coming from professionals. Um, when we look to, to information that comes from, from other areas, what I've said before in this House, that um, we need to be alert of what COVID-19 will be um, a serious challenge to Northern Ireland. And it's across all factors, not just the health service. It'll be there in economy, it'll be there in education, it'll be there in communities, it'll be there in our justice sector as well. So be aware of of the professional guidance that comes out there and how people prepare. Don't look to, to the panic. And I think the other point as well in regards to the messaging that's out there, 
What we've seen recently in regards to panic buying and that stockpiling is, is a nonsense at this minute in time. It's putting those people who actually need um, those essential items and can only afford them week by week under even more pressure. You know, when a mother can't get baby formula, when a mother can't get nabbies because they can only afford them on a weekly basis, that does not help society in general. So what I say to the member in regards to finding that middle ground, I think listen to the professionals, take heed of the professionals. And one thing I would say about the media here in Northern Ireland. I want to thank them and congratulate them too for portraying a very professional, balanced approach to what is a very challenging situation, because I think they have played a responsible part, and I would encourage them to continue to do that. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, and as with others, I respect the, uh, the hard work and the dedication um, and seriousness with which the Minister is treating his uh, responsibilities at this time. Can I ask him a question about the, the consideration that's gone into designing the plan specifically for Northern Ireland? Northern Ireland is, has a relatively low population density. We have only one real urban centre, with, with respect to colleagues from Derry and Newry and elsewhere, we have only one genuinely serious urban centre. We are a relatively dispersed rural population, yes, like the rest of this island. We also have lower than average use of public transport. Does that fact, does the, do those factors, that dispersed population, higher than average rural uh, community, relatively low use of public transport and relatively non-urban population, does that factor into our planning, the executive's planning for how to deal with COVID-19? The executive's planning for COVID-19 is for Northern Ireland. You know, so, so our focus, our surge plans within the health service, how we tackle this across all departments, will be to look to how it serves Northern Ireland. No, nowhere else. Our Northern Ireland executive is focused on how we get through COVID-19 as an executive collectively. That is a challenge. As I said earlier, there are differences of opinions. But one thing the general public expects from us is a united approach as to how we come together and tackle what is a very, very serious issue. The executive met this morning, there's a COBRA meeting this afternoon, and there's another executive this afternoon. So we are looking at, at this as a Northern Ireland basis across all executive departments. Matthew to supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. In addition to that, can I ask about specific guidance being given? Um, Kelly Armstrong asked about health visitors. If I could beg your indulgence, I'd like to ask about um, domiciliary care workers who we know are vital, the work and the guidance that's being given to them, community psychiatric nurses, if possible, particularly those who are dealing with probably psychotic people in the community, and lastly, um, social workers. If he's able to give some update on guidance for those groups, it would be helpful. Um, the, the Chief Medical Officer met a number of those groups and their representative bodies last week to, to bottom out exactly what specific guidance they need, because as we look at every sector across our Health and Social Care Board, there are specific nuances that do need addressed. So we're, we're, we're working on that, that piece of guidance with the relevant, I suppose, representative bodies uh, to make sure it's there. But for a lot of those organisations, they will already be aware that that guidance is either there in generic terms on the Public Health Agency's website or the Health and Social Care Board's website. And what I'd say, go back to them again, is to make sure that they check the most up-to-date uh, guidance that is relevant for their profession. And if there is a lag or a gap, I can assure the members it has been worked on. I call Alex Eason, of a minute and a half left. Could I um, thank the Minister for all the work he's done and all the work that he's continuing to do? Um, and could I ask him, what is the rationale for the closure of the Bangor minor injuries in relationship to the coronavirus? You know, and as I, I referred um, to the member earlier on, while we prepare for our surge plans, while we look at how we best tackle COVID-19 across our entire health and social care system. There is a piece of work being done to reprofile certain areas, certain wards, and may come to a stage even certain hospitals. So what I will say to members very clearly, there is no sacred cows left in the National Health Service while we come to challenge COVID-19. So those specific areas that we've protected in the past and looked for, this surge planning that we're doing will be challenging. It's challenging for our health and social care system. It will be challenging for us as public representatives where we do want to protect our local service or our local building to provide such a thing. But there's tough decisions being made centrally to make sure that when the surge of COVID-19 hits us, that we're best prepared 
to fight it when it comes. Time is up, and we move to questions to the Minister for Ag Infrastructure, and I call John Blue. Mr. Speaker.